So welcome back after lunch, and let me start with a quick question to wake you up. So what is the first thing that comes to your mind if you hear rust? Well, according to the propaganda, it should be memory safety. So what does it mean? It means that a compiler can give your program a sort of stamp of approval that it is not doing anything nasty with memory. Well, and yesterday, Pierre Emmanuel reminded you that there is ongoing effort to build a new GCC frontend to compile Rust. So naturally, you would ask, can this new GCC frontend also give me the stamp of approval? And the answer was no, and unfortunately it is still no, but we started moving in the direction, so that's good. You see, and you have seen yesterday that compiling Rust takes really a lot of work, and so does borrow checking. But we have noticed that the official Rust, C, Rust compiler Rust-C has released an independent library called Polonius, yeah, which is able to compute the latest borrow checking analysis outside of the compiler. So we were thinking, maybe we could borrow this Polonius. So I tried that, and I'm here today to tell you about how it went. So let's see the agenda for today. I will quickly tell you who I am and how I got to work on this project. Then I will quickly you know, tell you about some terminology because it can be especially confusing because there was a lot of evolution and some of the terms are used for different things. Then I will spend most of the time of the lecture or talk explaining what it actually means to do borrow checking and how it evolved and what are the problems there. And with that knowledge, you will be able to come back to Rust GCC and I will show you how I used a lot of glue to stick Polonius to Rust GCC. So let's start. My name is Jakub Dupak and about two and a half years ago, I was at the Embedded World Conference where I bumped into Jeremy and I'm here. So most of this work was done as part of my master's thesis, uh, led by Pavel Pisha here and by Arthur Cohen, maintainer of the Rust GCC project. And right now I've moved to work on Rust in Microsoft, but I would like to know that Microsoft is not involved in any Rust GCC work. So let's go to the terminology. So first, reference, you probably know that. Sometimes we call that a borrow, and it's just a pointer that is considered by the borrow checker uh, when computing the analysis. More importantly, when I say borrow or reference, I mean the variable that is holding the pointer. So borrowing means just taking a reference. Now, this is where it gets confusing. Loan is the result of borrowing. So if I take a reference of some variable, I get a loan. And then I assign it to some variable, which I will call reference. And I will differentiate you know, assigning different loans to different variables. Okay, so far? And finally, lifetime. You know, in some other sources called origin or region. And this is abstract notion of some part of the program. You can imagine a range of source code lines, a set of control flow graph nodes or anything. And particularly what we use lifetimes for is uh, to describe where in the program it is saved to the reference pointer. So I have said that the part of the compiler responsible for the analysis is called the borrow checker. So it's checking some kind of rules. So I have tried to really distill the idea and I came up with two fundamental rules. Well, the first one is don't access invalid memory. I mean, that sounds reasonable. The second one is connected to another slogan of Rust, which is fearless concurrency. So we don't want to allow uh, mutable reference aliasing. Uh, so let's go into more detail. 
for the first rule. And quite important uh, operation in Rust is called move. Rust has the ability to move objects in memory just by copying the bytes. But that is not always safe. So let's see an example here. We have a vector. Uh, it works just like C++ vector. We push a value 42 inside it. And now we assign the vector v1 to another variable v2. Now, at this point, well, first we need to make sure that v1 was valid so that we don't violate the rule number one. Uh, and that means that it had to be initialized and uh, it must not have been moved from before. So after we move v1 to v2, we can no longer access v1 because it's, we are lazy, so we will leave all the data there so it will contain a stale pointer or old number of elements and it could lead to all kinds of bugs. Uh, and to ensure that we will definitely not access V1, uh, we also need to make sure that there is no live pointer pointing to V1 because if there is a pointer, well, we cannot check, check anything. And the way this is handled is that you cannot, cannot move anything that can be pointed to. Okay, now the second part is about lifetimes, and it is we need to make sure that our references are pointing to some valid memory, hence the rule number one. So here is a silly example. We are returning a reference to temporary value, and this obviously doesn't work, but you can imagine more complex examples. Uh, and inside the function, it is uniquely determined how long the reference is valid. But it, this gets harder when you want to assign it into other variables and return it from functions. So at that point, you need to track the abstract notion of where you can, where is it safe to the reference variable, which is called lifetime. And whenever you assign one reference pointer to another, you need to make sure that this area where it is safe, where, where you think it is safe, only can get smaller. Because if it gets bigger, then you are lying to the program and you say that there is some part where you can reference it, but that's not true. So we need to make sure that it only stays the same or gets smaller. And in the proper Rust terminology, we call that subset of lifetimes, because usually lifetime is a set of something. Now, the second rule is we can either have one mutable reference or multiple shared immutable references. This also includes that we cannot modify the original variable because that's just the same as taking mutable reference. But we only care about references that are alive. That means that they may be uh, used later. So in this example program, we have a variable counter and we create first reference, ref1 to the counter, it is mutable, and the second reference. And this is error, but it is error only because the reference one is used after the creation of reference two. If I were to delete this line, then at least in the modern variants of the borrow checker, this would be fine because the compiler would be able to say, okay, well, it would be a problem if uh, when creating the reference two, the reference one was alive, but I can make it shorter and it's fine. So this is where it's, it gets more complicated. Also, most of the properties that I have shown you are quite easy to check inside a function, except for this part, knowing where a pointer is valid. And this gets, the, uh, this is some property that is global across the program. And uh, first, uh, global analysis of the whole program is very expensive. Also, it's not always possible if you cannot see the function inside, if you are linking or if you just uh, tell the compiler what the function signature is if you have interfaces, so that's not an option. So what borrow checker does is that it only checks functions. 
And at the function boundary, it is responsibility of the programmer to describe the invariance of the lifetimes that are going in and going out. And what we use for that are inference variables. They are written apostrophe and some name. So here, apostrophe A and apostrophe B. So we have a very simple code here where you have, again, a vector. It's quite nice for examples. And it is storing references. And the references are bounded by uh, lifetime A. Now, we want to create a method that will take any reference and try to push it into the vector. And we need to make sure that it is safe to do so. And I have told you that it is only safe to make the error where we think it is safe to the reference smaller. So we need to add a constraint and say that B must outlive A. So the area where B is valid must be larger than A. Now, this is something that the programmer promises. And the compiler, outside of the function, will assume it is correct. And inside of the function, it will check that it is correct. So, like I said, it's the responsibility of the programmer. But if the programmer messes things up, it doesn't compile. It doesn't cause bugs. So, yeah. Now, what's happening inside of the function? Again, I have quite simple example, and we have some references there. So first, you don't need to always write the lifetime annotations, but this just means that in the function signature, they are all the same. That's not really interesting, so let's make everyone different. Now we have this reference max inside, and because it's inside of the function, you cannot have annotations there because the lifetime is uniquely determined by the function itself, and it would be just pointless. So we will call the lifetime question mark one, and it is determined by the compiler. And now when we go through the program, we first look at the assignment A to max, and what that means. We must check that the lifetime is only getting smaller, so we create a constraint that apostrophe A outlives the lifetime one. Then we do the same for B, when it might be conditionally assigned to max. And when we return max, we do the same for C and one, except in the other order. And now this is subset, so this is transitive. So that means that for the function to work correctly, apostrophe A and apostrophe B uh, must outlive C. But you see that the function signature says nothing like that. And this will be a compiler. So you will need to add the var clause and A outlive C and B outlive C. Now, when I talk about lifetimes and being quite fuzzy what it actually is and how it's computed, and the point is that this is the thing that changed the most during the history of the borrow checker. So I will show you how it evolved and why is it today the way it is. So the first idea was, well, let's just go with scopes. So we will measure the lifetime of variables in scopes of local variables. There is asterisks because there can be some tricks to make some things compile, but it's not very good anyway. So we have example program again. Uh, we have a vector data that has some characters. We have method capitalize that needs a, refer a mutable reference to that vector, and it does something. And now we also call another method, which also needs mutable reference. So if the previous one is still alive, this program will not compile. Now, right now, this program is correct. It will compile even in very old versions of Rust. Because the lifetime of the reference, uh, muta reference mutable data is bounded only to the function call. So it is definitely, data is definitely valid. So rule number one is correct. 
And rule number two is also fine because we don't need that reference after the function call. Does that seem obvious too? Okay, let's do some innocent refactoring. We will create temporary variable and assign the reference to it. Well, now it's all ruined because lifetime is bound to scopes and the scope is up until the curly brace at the end. So now we cannot push anything because it is already borrowed. So rule number two is not about. We can kind of fix it by introducing a new scope, which is actually what internally happens for the original case. But this can be very easily broken if we add a control flow. So we have a function that works with a hash map that is not really important, but it tries to look inside the hash map and see if something is inside. Now we have two cases. Either something is inside and we get a reference to it, or nothing matching the key is inside, and then obviously we get no reference. So in the some branch, we have some reference that we need to care about, but in none branch, we have none. So technically, it should be illegal to create new reference and just insert new element, for example, default value here. Well, but this cannot work here because if we create a reference in the map get mutable, it is alive until the end of scope, which is the curly brace, which includes the none branch. So this was Rust until 2016, and this was actually used by people. It sounds quite amazing, but, or horrible, I don't know. So this is an error. So in 2016, a huge thing happened. Uh, they have moved from lexical lifetimes to non-lexical, and that means that now the lifetime is a set of control flow graph nodes, or actually it's more of a range of control flow graph nodes because variables cannot just stop being alive for some gap inside. So now we have the exactly same program and we have extremely simple control flow graph on the right. And first we call the method, so we create a reference. Now in the sum branch, we know that we have the reference, we use it there and we don't use it anymore and nowhere else we use this reference. So the program is fine, we have fixed it. So are we happy? Well, no. What if we actually want to return the value? So now we have added return value and we are returning it. So if we create the reference, now in the sum branch, we take the reference and we return it. So that means that it also needs, it is alive in the end, that means at the end of the match, and when we return. But we have a problem here, because it is created in match and it is alive in end. So under the current definition of lifetime, it also needs to be alive in the non branch. And it's ruined again. So we come to Polonius. Now there is a lot of confusion about a name, the name Polonius, mainly because it is two things. It is this algorithm to compute uh, and new idea of what lifetimes might be, and also it's the engine to compute it, the one we are trying to steal. So now lifetime is a set of loans. So the question I was actually trying to answer is, is any loan to the hash map valid at this point? And the idea of the Polonius algorithm is just try to answer this question directly. So if you look at the non branch, is there any uh, loan of the hash map? And the answer is obviously no, because we are not returning anything or we are not using anything. So we can create a new one and it's safe. This is 
part of the Rust in 2024. So this was fixed quite recently. Maybe let me get a little more details on the loans. So here, you, here we have simple code, which either, based on some condition, borrows X or it borrows Y. So we will call the first one loan L0 and the second one loan L1. And now what we, the lifetime, the apostrophe zero for R is a set literally L0 alone. And if you keep assigning the variables, we will just track the set uh, of any basically borrow expression that uh, the pointer could have come from. So, any questions so far? Okay, so let's see how the analysis actually runs. So, this is the diagram of the whole analysis. So, let's zoom in. First part is to look at the variables and the paths and indices and check where it is initialized and where it is moved. So, that's mainly the rule number one. We do a simple data flow and we compute for every control flow graph node where it is initialized. Uh, from that, we know when the variable needs to run a destructor, because that's only when it was initialized. So uh, we get information where the variable was alive for running destructors. Then on the right side, we also collect information when it was used. Uh, and from that, we compile the classic compile liveness of a variable. So nothing new there, and we compi combine this to one liveness. Now, we have on the left, variable belongs to region. That simply means that the type of variable is mentioning some lifetime annotation, or including the implicit ones. So we take the annotations, we compile it, uh, combine it with the liveness, and now for each lifetime, we get whether it is alive or not at each control flow graph point. On the right side, you see outlives. Those are the ones that I showed you in the, inside the function when you figure out that some lifetime needs to be larger than another. And it is a subset relation, so we compute transitive closure. And when we comp uh, combine it all together, we get the information at which control flow graph is each borrow alive. So finally, we can come, we can look, look at the point of the control flow graph that we are interested in, and we simply get the answer, is this borrow alive or not? And now, we are ready to come back to GCC. So, this is a comparison of the compiler pipeline for Rust GCC and Rust C. First, we have abstract syntax tree uh, and high level intermediate representation, which is just abstract syntax tree on steroids. So, that's the same. We also have the type uh, representation that's also the same. But then things try, uh, get quite different. On the Rossi side, we first have type level high level, <laughs> type high level intermediate representation, which is not important at all. But the next one is where all the magic happens. Middle or mid level intermediate representation is pretty much a crossover between the Rust and LLVM IR. So it is free address representation where we can easily work with control flow graph. And why I'm talking about this is, this is where the borrow checking analysis happens. So let's take an extremely simple uh, Rust function, which just takes a variable and wraps it inside a struct. And this is what mill looks like. So it has input of the variable, it has basic blocks, it has some simple statements, assignments, return. And this is how the representation look like, looks like. Also, non-trivial example, computation of Fibonacci, and you can imagine this, this is already quite big, so 
I only picked some interesting basic blocks. You can see this is, it's quite similar to the LLVM IR, but it's more rusty and simple. Uh, you have operations like equal, you have switches, you have go-tos, you have returns, moves, uh, and also there is this special annotation storage life and storage debt, which just says when variable comes into scope and goes out of scope. And you collect the information for the borrow checker by using the diagram that I showed you and you do the computation. Okay. And now we look on the Rust GCC part and we are getting into trouble. The next step is generic, but that's a three. So we need to get a control flow graph somewhere. Well, the first and like the ideal option was just to copy what Rust C is doing because we are doing Rust compiler and that's how they designed it. But as I mentioned, compiling Rust is a lot of work, and this would first mean to throw away a lot of work for translating into generic. It would also mean doing all the translation from generic to GIMP, like the work that is done there ourselves. And that we have talked about it and discussed that this is not an option. So what else can we do? The other option would be to try to hack generic and Gimple to contain enough information for us to use the Gimple control flow graph to compute the borrow checking. However, that's quite messy that there would be a lot of information that would be needed to be added inside the core parts of GCC and I mean, this is still quite experimental work and we would need to make sure that no things are transformed in such a, in some way that would suddenly make the borrow checking not work. So we have settled for a different way that we are already showed to yesterday and we have created completely new IR that is a dead branch. It has, this has advantages and disadvantages. These advantages are where we are doing some work twice. Uh, this is dead branch, so it is not covered by all the end-to-end -end tests. And it actually might diverge from the code gen. It turns out that the last part is not really a problem because we are supposed to check the source code and not the code gen, so that one is fine. Okay, now about the advantages. It's a dead branch and it's only used for one thing which means we can keep it extremely simple and so it was quite easy to do. So how this new borrow checker IR or bear it looks like it's very simple uh, similar to mirror we have basic block lists yeah, with basic blocks we have some central database for all the local variables and fields and indexes that are derived to it. Then we need to have extra information about the type signature, so that means arguments. Now, universal lifetimes is special name for lifetimes that are part of the signature, and universal time, lifetime constraints are the where clauses that I have shown you in the beginning. So, this is the whole IR, we have statement, which is either assignment or some control flow, or it's the storage life and storage debt, or this one you haven't seen, user type description is sort of a helper for explicit type annotations to just put it in. And this is all that we need. Actually, this is more than we need because we could like, assignment expression, which is just a copy, would, could be considered unary operation. So it could be squashed even more. But uh, then we come to the problem that this is a dead branch and it's hard to test. So I have made the decision to make it a little bit larger than it needs to be, to be as similar to mirror as possible, so that when you actually see the dump of bear, and the dump of mirror, then more or less there should be the same and you can actually compare them visually. 
So this helps a lot during the development because for a long time this was the only way to test something. So this is the Fibonacci function in the borrow checker IR. I mean, I think if I haven't told you that this is different, I would get away with it. But you can see, uh, like in the third of the screen, the underscore six is not equals, it's operator. Because we don't care anymore about what operation it was. We just care about the flow of the data. Uh, again. Yeah, we actually need to know what function is it because there are specific constraints and lifetimes for each function. So this is something that needs to stay. So this is what the IR looks like. And those are the information that we collect. Uh, it follows exactly the diagram that, excuse me, uh, that I showed you. And we take all this information, we collect it into set of vectors, and we pass it, pass it to the engine that we borrowed from Rust-C. It gives us a very list of errors that happened, and what we do is just we display them to the user. Now, there is a little complication where, we needed, where I needed to do some extra work. If you have just assignment of simple references, this gets easier, but in Rust, you have a lot of complex types, which are most of the time generic. And if you have something like this, you have no idea what to do with the lifetimes because they might be used for anything. So inside the type rep representation, we actually needed to store a lot of information about how the, life, where the lifetimes are propagated and how they are used so that we could compute variance of each lifetime. So if it's just assigned, like an X for A, yeah, it is, I'm not sure, I think contravariant, but not really important. Yeah, so if we assign it the whole structure, then the subset relation stays the same. But if it were to be used in a parameter of a function, it would actually be turned around because that's how the variants work. Now we have B that is not used anywhere, so we don't care about it. And then we have T, which actually, when used, may contain another set of lifetimes, which is where it gets complicated. And T is used inside bar, so now we need to look into bar and do sort of iterative computation to find out what the lifetimes are actually doing and what are they used for. So this is something we need to extend. Now, this is what was asked yesterday. Yeah, right now, we are using Cargo and Rust-C to build some parts of the compiler. And the reason is that the borrow checker engine itself is written in quite advanced Rust. Well, it's not really advanced anymore. It was 2018, but it's still ahead of us. Uh, we had a similar prog uh, problems with procedure macros, I think, and with the lib format. So this is happening in more places. So, but for borrow checking, uh, the conclusion is that borrow checking is not needed for the compiler to run. So it is optional component that is supposed to be compiled externally and provided as a static library with C ABI and it can be used when necessary, and once we are able to compile Polonius, we then actually use this to bootstrap the compiler, first use it without borrow checker, and eventually get there. Uh, I would like to mention that there was a Google Summer of Code student who continued my work uh, this summer, and he took the IR and he added the location information there. So, a quick demonstration of some errors. The current state that for anything that we can translate to the borrow checker IR, we can find most of the errors. So, that means errors caused by invalid moves. For example, if the value was moved before, uh, when the subset of lifetimes are wrong, 
or you know, when you have errors with loans, which is the mutable aliasing thing again. So again, a simple code, we have a structure A, uh, which contains something, but it is not explicitly marked to be trivially copyable. That means it's not. And in let A, let B, we assign it, uh, we assign A to B, so at this point it is moved. And at the last line, we try to move it again. So that's error we should detect. Now, after my work, the borrow checker would tell you, we have found some move errors in the function. Go figure. Well, it's good because after this work of the Google Summer of Code student, the compiler will actually tell you, hey, A was moved. He used A again at this line. Fix it. So now, Another simple example uh, for loans, we have a mutable reference of X and immutable reference of X, and at the last line, this is the necessary condition, we are again using the mutable reference, and the error used to be found loans errors in the function. Good luck. Well, we have come a long way, and now it tells you use of borrowed value uh, the borrow was here, and another value, it was used here. There is still some room for improvement, uh, because loan errors actually involves three places. Uh, the one where you make one wrong borrow, the other one where you make another loan borrow, and the last line, which caused the first borrow to be alive. So right now, we don't have any way to track that third location, but so there is still some work to be done here. And finally, subset errors. This is where the, compar uh, the programmer did not provide enough information in the type signature. So again, my error message is found some subset errors in the function, add some constraints. That's easy, you will figure that out. Well, not anymore. Uh, now it will tell you, in this function, it's wrong, and it actually this lifetime and this lifetime. What it doesn't tell you is which order you need to add. So we still have little room for improvement here, but I think this is already quite helpful. So let's go to conclusion. You might have heard some rumors about problems with Polonius, and that it is actually not used in Rust-C anymore. That's true. Well, the problem with Polonius, the engine, is that it is very formal analysis that does a computation with many states, and it has the problem that it is creating too many states. So for some more complex programs, it actually blows up because of out of memory errors. Uh, so what Rust-C did, when I said that they are right now using Polonius, uh, they actually tried this, decided to postpone it, and they have used the existing infrastructure for the previous variant, the non-lexical lifetimes, to compute the analysis. The difference is uh, they are doing computation already when collecting the information, so they can sort uh, many states locally. Now, okay, so did I waste a lot of time doing this work? Well, I hope not, because the only part that was actually connected to the engine was like 5% of the work, and the rest would need to be done anyway. But now we have something. We can actually take the, all the infrastructure, the, the new types infrastructure, the computation, the whole new IR, we can take it, and we have something to test it against. Now, what we will need to do, I've talked about this with the Rust-C people, uh, would be to either wait, because they want to fix Polonius, and maybe by the time we iron out all the problems above Polonius, it will already be fixed, so that would be ideal. 
And the other option is that we would need to go with a non-lexical lifetime approach. So we would need to add some computation ourselves. And the people I have talked to were very helpful and they offered to like show us which parts of the Rust C we need to steal. And here we actually have two ways where we can go. First is just go to Rust C and steal the parts that we need. Or this is actually what was what they suggested me to consider. You've seen that most of the computation is just doing a lot of data flow analysis. And GCC already has quite a few tools to do that. So what we could actually do is get rid of this polynews dependency at all and you know, do all parts of this analysis with the tools already we already have. So there are many ways we can go from here. Uh, and there is a lot of work to be done. And more, the, uh, in more detail, you can find it in the thesis. But the biggest problem is that, uh, as I said, Rats is a complex language. So not of the, all the language constraints, uh, lang excuse me. Not all of the language constructs can already be translated to the borrow checker IR. The IR is fine, but we need, we miss the translation steps for some really complex features like match, which is like a switch, but it creates a very complicated control flow. So this is 80% of what needs to be fixed. Finish the translation of the IR, then uh, there is actually a little trick to allow some more programs to pass by borrowing things more lazily. So this would need also to be added to the translation. And then also we need to handle drops. That's Rust term for destructors. And the problem is that Rust GCC doesn't handle them at all, I think, right now. So yeah, and uh, then inside of a single type, there are some constraints between the lifetimes also can arise, and we are missing a few of them. And then there is always a lot of room to improve the error messages, and actually you can get more errors with the same cause. So what Rusty is doing, it is collecting them together, and it takes notes of the priority why it happened. For example, if it happened because of temporary value, uh, temporary variable, it's probably not, not the part of the error message that you want to show. So it can figure out what is the root cause and only show that. So that is another way where we can move. And the final part is this works between multiple libraries. And the way it works is that you export the data that you need, the variance, uh, the lifetime constraints, and it's part of the header of the library, so that parts need to be finished too. And that's all. So thank you, and if you have any questions. Wow. How does Polonius actually interact with beer? With what? With beer. Like you, in GC Rust, you have a beer, and the Polonius, I suppose, is uh, written against mirror? Yes. So the, uh, the interface is. Hmm. This is the interface a set of informations about the program that we collect when we do a pass through the bear. So, for example, the first one is when a loan is created, so where there is expression to borrow something, we take a note that it happened with origin, that's the name of the lifetime. Uh, we give some unique identifier to the loan, and we tell it what control flow graph number it happened at. So we create this information from the beta, mm -hmm. and we pass this information directly to Polonius. So uh, Polonius doesn't work directly with the uh, IR? No. Okay. Th that's the idea why is it independent. And the original idea was that it could be used for some research and anything. So they really kept it only to, to the information that you need. Mm -hmm. 
but that's also the reason why it doesn't work. <laughs> okay. Uh, but but will the another implementation of Polonius that will uh, that will not be like over engineered? Will it work also on the AR there directly, or will it also use an API? Well, I can't really speak for that because. Even in the, for the Rust people, it's like in the stage of pitching ideas. Mm -hmm. But what they would want to do is to keep the same interface, but to be able to like start with really rough resolution, mm -hmm. find out what the interesting parts of the programs are, and only uh, expand uh, the states there. Mm -hmm. So the interface would ideally stay the same. That's the goal. So, they have already achieved the borrow checking they need with a lifetime, so we will see how much motivation will be there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's good to see the uh, diagnostic improvements in the slides toward the end. I think. Yeah, it was amazing. In the, um, I, I think in the, the second one you said it's better, but it's not great. It, you know this still room for improvement. Yes. Um, um, what's the issue there? Let me find this. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Okay, so, no. No, it was the lifetime. There's a problem. This one. Okay, so. I think no, it's the lifetime ones. I think it's a two slides further on or something. Yeah, sorry. I... Yeah, uh, that one. Okay, uh, so here you need to add some constraint. You need to that one of the out, uh, lifetimes can must outlive the other. Uh -huh. So right now uh, we are telling you these two lifetimes need to have a relationship, but we are not telling you what the relationship it needs. Uh -huh. Needs. Yeah, and is is that basically the, the same as what Rust C emits? I guess is the question. Uh, or does it do a better job? tells you, most of the time, it tells you quite a lot about what uh, relation you need to apply. Okay. I, I think actually Rust C or, uh, will be able to provide you like completion to alt enter in the editor and fix it. So yeah. that's, and, and, and yes. Matches. Yeah, and I would say the, um, I shamelessly, admit, I admit to shamelessly using Rust C as a source of inspiration for improvements to GCC source printing and underlining all that. Is there anything needed to be added to a GCC's, I guess, diagnostic show locus.cc to, to like better visualize a borrow checker concepts or other diagnostics in um, GCC the Rust? I guess this would be best answered by Kushal because I did not work on this part. But I, I think like what's really blocking us is having the information. Mm -hmm. So I don't know about that we would hit any like limitation of uh, GCC, but I, I, I'm not even sure how this visualization is created. So oh, right, yeah. So it, uh, typically, uh, it's having the data rather than visualizing like, the data is, is the problem. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Like, this is what I made, so. <laughs> no. He's in India. Right, so how much are these borrow checking rules set in stone? So, because I assume it rejects some valid code, but I also assume that the Rust C team is probably interested in improving the borrow checking in and allow it to check more code, right? So, if, is there a pro problem that Rust developers are going to rely, rely on the cleverer borrow checking rules in Rust C and uh, is the GCC? Rust uh, implementation going to suffer from uh, having to keep up with the new features in Rust C. I guess not only in the borrow checker, but also I see that Rust is really uh, adding a lot of features mm -hmm. right, to the language actively. And are we well, is it possible to keep up with? I would say that like the fundamental rules are set in stone. What is changing is 
like the precision that you are you can track the things and now and then you add some special case mostly to how you generate the mirror so you can track it better uh, but like the basic rules i think haven't changed that much it's more about really lifetimes and one like big limitation that i have talked with somebody yesterday was when you pass a struct into a function right now it has to assume that you might use any part of the struct so you cannot like uh, even you might have like very simple function that will just error, uh, output error message uh, and use something very trivial in the, inside the struct but if you use something also outside then the function call hides the logic and the borrow checker has no idea so just the whole struct is poisoned so this is actually a limitation I hit quite a lot. But this would really need to extend the expressiveness of the lifetimes to be able to describe much more complicated things, which again would be a lot more complicated for the programmers. It wouldn't really be that hard for a compiler because it's tracking these things inside the function anyway. So. And so, do you think it's re realistic for GCC Rust to keep up with the uh, the am amount of development that's happening f in Rust C? Uh, general or for borrow checker? Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, generally, generally. Like, I, I think borrow checker will not move that much because it's like approaching the state where unless you create some like completely new rules, what? about what I mentioned, it is quite converging to what you can do. For Rust in general, well, I mean, it has like order of magnitude, more people working on it. Yes. Uh, I don't know how, like there, there, there is actually a lot of push to stabilize things. One thing that is happening inside Rust is actually to stabilize mirror and to have it as a fixed interface that you can interact with. So that will slow Rust-C a lot, I think. But yeah, it will be hard. Thank you. By the way, is borrow checking like, is, is it theoretically possible to have a borrow checker that checks the rules with absolute precision? Is, is that like, is it feasible or is it like NP hard to do something like that? I mean, I think that is happening inside a function. So, if you would do like whole program analysis, basically inlining everything with some like clever things, not to actually expand the code, but propagating all the information across the boundaries that it would be possible, but I don't think it's like feasible for real world use, like performance wise. Yeah, okay, thanks. Thank <laughs> you.